state during the past decade. And we hope all of us will, all of you all will also join us on June 17th when we continue this long view conversation with uh, Nancy McLean, who's author of Democracy in Chains. But before we start our conversation with Professor Nichol, we have some neighbors on call business to cover. Uh, next slide. First, we wanna make sure that everybody is comfortable with Zoom. By this point, we've all done a lot of Zooming, but still a um, few little things to point out here. First of all, you notice the stop video sign there on the left. All of these buttons are on the bottom row of your screen, should be. So uh, it improves the network traffic tremendously if everybody will stop the video, except of course our speakers who we will uh, keep on. But click on stop video and um, back, ooh, we're moving along. And then there's also the chat box here in the middle. If you click on that, then it gives you a way to enter in your questions and comments that you wanna make along the way. And then thirdly, at the top right of your screen, unless you're on an iPad, and then I believe it's on the left, there are two options for how everything looks on your screen. There's gallery view and speaker view. During our presentation with Professor Nichol, it will go, it'll look a lot better if you click on speaker view, so he will stay right there, big in the middle, okay? All right, next slide. Um, as you all know, there's going to be an election this fall, no matter what. It's an enormous opportunity for us here in North Carolina, and one we cannot squander. That's why Neighbors on Call is laser focused on flipping at least one chamber of the North Carolina General Assembly, and this is what it takes in terms of number of seats. Neighbors on Call is working on uh, for four House candidates. We have the two on the left who are running to flip the seats and for their district, Ricky Hurtado from Alamance, Nicole Quick from Guilford County, and then the two folks on the right uh, need to hold on to their seats because we can't afford to lose a single one. We worked with them during the 2018 election and helped them flip their seats. So it's Representative <clears throat> Terrence Everett and uh, Sydney Batch. Both of those are from Wake County. Campaigning for legislative elections will help us turn North Carolina blue all the way up to the top of the ticket. Now, until the coronavirus hit back in earlier this year, Neighbors on Call was a robust canvassing operation. We knocked over 15,000 doors for the 2000 election, and we had already knocked over 10,000 doors for the 2020 election by early March of this year. Then we quickly have pivoted to phone banking and we estimate that we have already made at least 8,000 calls. The more callers we have now, the better our chances are at the polls in November. So we have a special phone bank uh, put together, especially for those of you who aren't feeling the phone bank brew quite yet, because we do need your help. This is Becca, hi. Uh, if the idea of phone banking makes your palms sweat, we understand that, and we ask you to join us for a special hand-holding session on June 20th as part of a phone bank for Sydney Batch called Overcoming Fear and Loathing, a guide to liking or at least tolerating phone banks. Here's what you can expect. First, the campaign manager will train us, as always, and then Representative Batch will speak to us if she's available, as the candidates often do before a phone bank. And then the fear and loathing trainees, of which I will be one, will get on a Zoom call just like this one, and our very own Knock East chapter leader, Isabel Geffner, who loves to phone bank for reasons that some of us can't quite relate to, will be in the Zoom fishbowl making her phone calls. And the rest of us will just observe, we'll ask questions, and when we're ready, we'll take a deep breath and try some calls. A Knox support team will be there the whole time to answer your questions in the chat as we go. So it'll be a live demo. We can do this. The sign up link for the phone banks uh, will, should be going in the chat now and it's always on the website. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Professor Jean Nickel. Professor Nickel is currently the Boyd Tinsley Distinguished Professor of Law at UNC. He became the director of the UNC Center on Poverty, Work, and Opportunity 
which is now the North Carolina Research Fund, after serving as law dean at the University of Colorado, dean of the UNC School of Law, and president of the College of William and Mary. Professor Nickel has a long and distinguished list of pu publications and awards. He is the author of The Faces of Poverty in North Carolina, Stories from Our Invisible Citizens, and more recently, most recently, in Decent Assembly, the North Carolina Legislature's Blueprint for the War Against Democracy and Equality. He has been a columnist for the Raleigh News and Observer for over 15 years and writes regularly for the Progressive Populist, the Charlotte Observer, and the Durham Herald. In 2013, UNC gave him its Thomas Jefferson Award, the university's highest faculty honor for his work with the Center on Poverty and has written and spoken public testimony publicizing the impact of economic injustice in North Carolina. Tonight, he is here to talk with us about his latest book, Indecent Assembly, and to help us understand what we need to know as activists in North Carolina. We will open up for audience questions later in the evening, time allowing, but we probably won't get to all of them tonight. In the meantime, please do add your questions in the chat. Professor Nickel, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Becca and uh, Susan. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I, I enjoy just listening in to the gab fest uh, before we started. It's, <laughs> I, I doubt that anything I have to say will be as interesting as that, but I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd like to start out by asking you, just in general terms, um, we think we're all starting from a shared sense that the Republican leadership in the General Assembly has not been good for our state. And you wrote in the opening of your book, since 2011, the North Carolina Republican General Assembly has waged the stoutest war against people of color and low income citizens seen in the United States in half a century. So for those of us who are relative newcomers to North Carolina, and those of us who maybe haven't been tuned in to what the legislature has been up to, can you start by giving us just an overview of the highlights, or we might want to call them the lowlights, of the Republicans' attacks, and what are the common threads that run through those? Sure, sure. And let me um, say just uh, as we started, before we start, it's, uh, that I'm really uh, heartened to hear this uh, work of Neighbors on Call and uh, your efforts together. Uh, the fact that you do uh, uh, phone banks, which <laughs> I've done a lot of in my life, and uh, I'm not one who thinks they're tremendously fun, uh, but they are hugely crucial. Uh, Getting out the vote is tremendously crucial in North Carolina. One of the things that I say, I think late in the book, is that, uh, you know, we're often described as a purple state uh, where we could go one way or another. And I spend a lot of time out and about uh, around the state in various communities. And uh, if we're a purple state, that shouldn't be confused. Uh, sometimes people hear purple and they think, well, uh, that means they're kind of, uh, uh, they have a bunch of people, moderates in the middle, and that if you could just uh, reach out to them in the most effective way, that uh, then it's possible to prevail. Uh, or we have a lot of people who are undecided. Uh, it's my sense that, that we may be purple, but it's because we're an evenly divided state. Uh, uh, we're almost like 50-50 split. In, and, and I think that we don't do a lot in our elections to actually persuade. We're not very successful in persuading uh, uh, those of the other side to change uh, uh, their minds. That Our elections are all about uh, getting out the vote, uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's been a long time since, uh, I mean, I, I think we're evenly split, but those two halves, uh, know what they think <laughs> they, know what they think in uh powerful ways and the, and the only thing we can do to really be successful is to outnumber uh, uh the other half so that's what you're doing and that is uh the most important work so uh what's the book about it's a dangerous thing to ask an author okay what's the book about because there's a possibility i would go on too long uh but 
let me just say this um, kind of broadly speaking. I, I wrote the book for two reasons. Um, the first is, um, so they've been at this for almost 10 years, uh, um, uh, control of the General Assembly, and for much of that, most or all of the levers of government in North Carolina. It's very common for people to look at, like I do as well, one outrage or another that these folks have uh, committed. You know, maybe it's uh, their voting escapades or their redistricting es escapades or HB2 or their abortion uh, laws or their attacks on the judiciary. But there's less written which looks at the package as a whole. Uh, and uh, I thought it's good to sort of put a lot of it in one place that people could uh, pick up and uh, have a look at. And I will say this, I, I was among, this won't surprise anybody, I was among those who were already sort of pissed off before I started uh, researching and uh, writing this book. But uh, in, re in researching the book, I became even more annoyed. <laughs> it is, it's a lot worse as a whole, uh, even than it is in its uh, particulars. It's an astonishing record of constitutional and equality-based uh, transgression. So first, I just thought it was good to put it all in one spot. But secondly, and maybe more important, uh, I'm a constitutional lawyer, and it occurred to me that these attacks uh, flow along two very broad bases, um, and they are attacks on the fundamentals of American government and the American promise. And so it's not a surprise the book ends up being called something like uh, the, the, the roadmap for an attack on uh, democracy and equality, because that's what they're doing. Uh, so there, there are powerful, I mean, I, there are chapters uh, first dealing with equality, uh, chapters on race, on poverty, on uh, women's uh, equality, on uh, LGBT rights, and then also on uh, public education and uh, uh, the environment. Uh, but secondly, uh, they don't stop there. In other words, they don't stop at uh, altering the uh, rights and duties and obligations of North Carolinians. They engage on fundamental attacks on the structures of American constitutional government, on uh, what I like to refer to as the fundaments. And I like this word, fundament. It's like fundamental, but uh, it means the the basis or the theory of a system of government, but it also has the secondary meaning, which is like the base of a building, the, what we build from. And in a sense, uh, my book is about the notion that these folks are violating our compact. Uh, they not only uh, uh, wage war against equality uh, and the 14th Amendment, the most consequential of American constitutional provisions. Uh, but they move beyond that and they attack those measures which we have used and developed over centuries, really, to secure our experiment in constitutional government. So the independence of courts, separation of powers, attacks on democracy uh, itself, uh, attacks on uh, deference to local government uh, and the like, and then even attacks on truth or candor, um, so that uh, this ends up being a challenge to the basics. Uh, it's not, in other words, just a, a regular political disagreement between liberals and conservatives or right-wingers and left-wingers, uh, but it ends up this decade legacy ends up being a challenge to an array of things that we have developed and hold sacred over not just decades or generations, but literally centuries. They are the ways that we 
have come to define the American experiment, the ways that we have come to uh, define uh, the American character. So they end up waging a war. When you wage war against democracy, when you wage war against uh, judicial independence and the rule of law, when you wage war against uh, truth itself, uh, uh, when you reopen uh, fundamental claims about whether or not uh, a major political party, for example, is going to uh, embrace race discrimination after our history and our challenges and our disparities. I think uh, most of us who've been around North Carolina for a long, long time thought we were past some things. And uh, having, in effect, a white people's caucus, which is, I, I go to some uh, discomfort to say, uh, uh, our folks go into a white people's caucus in both houses, uh, pass bill after bill, which is meant to make life more challenging and difficult and to deny participation and power to uh, uh, African-American Tar Heels. Uh, they wage war as well on uh, low-income people in a way that hasn't happened in 50 years in uh, the United States, much less in North Carolina. So my point, and I'm sorry, to, I'll stop this, but my point is this is, this election and this legacy is about more than the give and take of normal politics. Um, these folks have broken the compact, the compact which we usually take for granted. I mean, we may think there are liberal and conservative ways of looking at things, but we don't think you're going to dedicate yourself to trying to stop people from being able to, to vote, for example. We don't think that you're going to dedicate yourself as a, uh, a, a leading political party to cheating in the electoral process, putting your thumb on the operation of democracy. Uh, we don't think you're going to dedicate yourself to treating women as if they weren't full participants in uh, uh, North Carolina's public and uh, uh, political life. So this this is about more than the normal give and take of politics. It's about what it means to be a North Carolinian, what it means to be an American. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, it is uh, about patriotism. Uh, we, uh, we say that, uh, or there's an old saying that I love, which is to be an American is an ideal. To be a Frenchman is a fact. Now, I don't mean to, I love Paris, I don't mean to abuse the French. Uh, and I think what that means is, um, in the United States, it's not what we say is the nation, like Lyndon Johnson argued, is uh, committed to an idea, a set of commitments or principles which we wind around notions of liberty and equality. And that's what it means to be an American. It's not your race or your tribe or your religion or your sex or your sexual orientation or your language or your geography, which uh, describes what it means to be an American. It's your commitment to this foundational set of ideals. Uh, that's the core of the American experiment. Uh, that's why we say to be an American is an idea, uh, not just a place or a tribe or a family or a network. These folks are violating that idea. They are violating that compact, the fundaments upon which we have built our society. They don't say that they're running to change the American promise, to change the American constitutional structure, but that's what they're doing. They do it every day. They favor power, partisan power, over those foundational things like liberty, equality, democracy, the rule of law, which we say are the most crucial to us. And so those things, including even candor, uh, are on the table in, in this uh, upcoming election. Professor Eagle, can I proceed? Quicker than that, sorry. No, no, but I was just wondering if you could add just a few specifics to that. Like, that, it, what are the examples that we could kind of hang our hat on. Let's, that let's talk about race, for example. The first chapter is on race. Now, first of all, uh, we should remember this. 
North Carolina has a long and brutal history when it comes to race. Um, it's not as bad in some ways as Mississippi and Alabama, but it includes uh, Wilmington, it includes other uh, slaughters, uh, it includes lynchings, it is long, brutal, and cruel. Uh, we also have gigantic disparities this very day on the basis of race in every component of life in North Carolina. We're acting much surprised by them um, during the coronavirus era, but they're only a surprise to people who haven't looked at them otherwise. They pervade every aspect of our lives and they have from the first day of our founding until this morning, and they still do. Given that, what has happened in North Carolina? First of all, it's important to understand we are governed by large Republican caucuses in both houses that are all white. Now, I've been told as a university professor many times, it's rude to say that, you shouldn't mention it. Uh, apparently it's not rude to be a white people's caucus, uh, but it is rude to mention it, to indicate that's uh, what it is. We have a, uh, a somewhat diverse Democratic Party, thankfully, I wish it was uh, more diverse, but when the Republicans go into their caucuses and come up with our laws, uh, they move into rooms in which there are no people of color. All right? uh, it's surprising, 150 years after the passage of the 14th Amendment, that uh, we're governed by a white people's caucus, but that's what we have. Then what did they do? What, what have they done uh, in the last uh, eight years in those caucuses? First of all, they've given us the federal courts have ruled the most aggressive, the largest racial gerrymander ever presented to an American court. That's trying to feather their own nest by limiting the participatory rights of African Americans. Next, they passed the stoutest voter suppression law uh, in uh, modern American history. At least that's what the election law uh, scholars tell us. With surgical precision, they went through all the rules and they said for uh, those that are more uh, readily used by uh, black Tar Heels, we're going to uh, limit them, cut them, cut them out. Those that are regularly used by uh, white voters, we're going to expand them. And the federal courts ruled that that was a violation, of course, uh, of the Equal Protection Clause. They move beyond that. Uh, they have frequently enacted what I call sore loser laws. So they don't like, for example, the outcome of elections in the Greensboro City Council. Um, uh, they don't like the fact that uh, Greensboro had the wisdom to elect a, a city council that had a whole lot of uh, Democrats on it and a whole lot of people of color. So they simply decide uh, in, a, in what the courts call a truncated process to redistrict and double bunk those uh, folks who got elected and in effect overturn the, uh, the results of a municipal election. They've done similar things in uh, Wake County in the school districts uh, and in the uh, 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 county commission. Um, next, uh, they repeal the Racial Justice Act. Um, we have finding after finding that uh, the death penalty being de deployed on the basis of race. Rather than fixing that, they say, well, we know a way to fix that. We'll just repeal the Racial Justice Act. Uh, we're better off uh, not knowing that, not having it sort of uh, uh, put uh, into our faces. They pass a series of laws which make it uh, more likely to have more segregated racially uh, public schools because of voucher programs and uh, limiting the lifting the uh, measures concerning uh, charter schools. Unlike the rest of the nation in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, we pass a law that makes it harder to get police video camera footage uh, released uh, to the public. Then we pass a law that uh, makes an icon out of Confederate war memorials all over the state and says that uh, uh, they can't be moved by 
uh, local decision makers, even though they're uh, traditionally empowered to do that. I could give you a list of about uh, 15 matters. I'm, I'm just writing a chapter for another uh, magazine on this, and so I've been working on it, thinking about it, but this is what it means. If we just take race, just to begin with, we have a white people's caucus. They go into their closed sessions. They passed law after law, which has been found to be overt, intentional, uh, uh, direct race-based discrimination. Uh, they uh, uh, do it regularly, repeatedly, uh, wounding the opportunities of uh, African Americans. They even admit it sometimes, uh, like with uh, a redistricting. But they say, "Yeah, but I, we're not. Uh, we're not trying to hurt black people because they're black. We're trying to hurt them because they're Democrats." Uh, as if uh, that should be seen as a constitutionally appropriate excuse. So we have a white people's assembly passing systematic agenda of laws to hurt the participatory and dignitary rights of African-Americans, continuing to do it, doing it unapologetically. And if people even raise a question uh, about it, uh, they say, well, you're uh, being rude and you're playing the race card uh, and the like. There is no doubt uh, that they're waging the stoutest war on people of color that we have seen in at least 50 years, seen since the Jim Crow era, uh, and they plan to continue it. Now, I don't think North Carolinians believe, broadly speaking, at least God knows I hope not, uh, that we're to have a political party, which is A, operates as an all-white operation, and then means to exclude black people from its uh, participation. In other aspects of life, we would say, God, we're not gonna allow that to take place. Uh, but we're allowing it now, we're allowing it uh, with this legislature. It's a war or a crusade, which has its uh, counterparts with uh, uh, their efforts against poor people, their efforts against women, their efforts against uh, the LGBT community in a broad-based attempt to reject the demands of the Equal Protection Clause. And the question for us is whether we're gonna put up from that. They, they mean to out Mississippi, Mississippi. There's no doubt about that. I don't think that's what North Carolinians want. It's what's happening. It's, what, it's what's happening on their watch and not enough of, of us are paying attention to it, but it means we're gonna have a, a state whose public character is destroyed if we don't take back this government. Susan, I can't hear you. There we go, sorry. Um, given that, uh, and we touched on this a little earlier, or you touched on a little earlier, that this is really um, kind of a 50-50 state. In the case in point, Governor Cooper won his election by less than 1%. It was about 10,000 votes, but less than 1% of the total votes passed. So I didn't find out with this right wing legislature. Was it organic, did it about naturally, accidentally, or was there a plan? And if so, whose plan? Well, um, I think that uh, electorally, there are plans that they have deployed. It's been uh, well-versed, uh, it's obvious. We hired, our, our legislators hired this guy from DC who died and there was so much, uh, what's his name, Huffeller? Uh, there was so much controversy because uh, Common Cause got a hold of his notes. Uh, but he was well known for intense racial and political gerrymandering in a way that no one else seems to have been able to manage. And uh, uh, so that's uh, resulted in a huge disadvantage in the electoral process since uh, they took over in uh, 2011. Uh, it, it's meant that uh, for Democrats to actually prevail in uh, get the House and the Senate, you would have to have very large supermajorities all across the state. Uh, some of that's been invalidated, both by uh, state courts and federal courts. Uh, the, as, as you pointed out in the initial discussion, the districts are somewhat uh, better now. But I think on that front, uh, we know what their plan was. Their plan was to disadvantage 
Democrats and to disadvantage uh, people of color. They've been quite uh, transparent about it. At least uh, they haven't successfully hidden it. Um, they keep after it. They do it every time. Uh, even after they're chastised by the courts they're, uh, uh, and their work product is invalidated, they go right, right back to the drawing board and discriminate on the basis of race uh, and on uh, the basis of politics. I think they do it for this reason. Uh, uh, why are they after it? I think they know, they look around and they know that you're not going to be able to govern indefinitely in North Carolina as a white people's party. Uh, the numbers are against it. It makes it harder and they're getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and you know, uh, a lot of folks who uh, are white are not that thrilled with uh, carrying out a racial agenda. It's not sort of where they define themselves. So they know the demographics are against them uh, and, uh, unless they can stack the deck. And so they have been ingenious at stacking the deck. The national election law scholars say this has been the most uh, brutal uh, uh, and biased uh, electoral scheme that's uh, uh, been seen uh, in American government. And I think they're doing it because they think if we're going to hold on to power, we're going to have to cheat. Uh, and uh, so we're, gonna, we're good at cheating. We don't mind it. Uh, that means we only weigh our commitment to democracy against our lust for power. And that's, we don't have much of a commitment to the democracy and we really want power. For people like me, who have, I've been a constitutional law professor all my life, and we assumed that these soft protections of constitutional law were more consensus based, that uh, notions of uh, rule of law, judicial independence, equal democratic participation, uh, that they're widely accepted. Uh, so that uh, most folks looking at politics would say, well, I, I believe we ought to have higher taxes or lower taxes, or I want this kind of uh, national security or that. But uh, I believe in doing it through a democratic process. I don't believe in stopping people from being able to vote, for example, or I don't believe in having an all white caucus that dedicates its effort in 2020 to disenfranchising black people. Uh, there are certain rules of the road that we all accept. Well, we've been surprised to learn in North Carolina in the last 10 years, a lot of folks don't accept those rules of the road. They're not committed to them. Now, Christ, we've learned in Washington DC that it's even a lot bigger than that with this uh, uh, scoundrel. Uh, in, bio bastard that we have as president. But, uh, uh, but still, that's what's at stake in North Carolina. I think that's what their motive is to hang on to power. And then the other side of it, um, I think that's what they're doing to hang on to power. What is their agenda substantively? I think it is constant service to the wealthy, to the white, to the wealthy. Uh, the only real domestic uh, economic policy they have is dramatically cutting taxes for the richest, cutting benefits for the poor, and raising taxes of the poor. They've done that astonishingly in North Carolina. They have uh, waged a war on poor people unlike anything we've seen. Uh, for those of you who are new, I could run through that quickly. Uh, we uh, uh, rejected Medicaid expansion, as you know. Uh, kicked in effect five to six hundred thousand people off of health care, even though the federal government was paying almost the entirety of the of the fare. We in 2013 we uh, enacted the largest cut to an unemployment compensation program in American history, taking us from the middle of the pack to now having uh, at these times with these uh, with this virus having the stingiest worst unemployment compensation program in America. We became the only state in American history to, to repeal its earned income tax credit. That's a little uh, tax credit that went to families, working families, making about 
$35,000 a year to offshoot the, to offset the fact that so many of our taxes are regressive. Uh, so they raised the taxes of uh, low income families making about $35,000 a year. Uh, they then dramatically cut the income tax rate uh, and flattened it, which helped the people at the top and increased sales taxes. And they did so overtly uh, as a scheme to make uh, poor people pay uh, more in taxes. Uh, they uh, repealed the estate tax, which only uh, uh, benefited the very wealthiest of our members. They then uh, made a huge array of cuts to benefit programs. Um, uh, they kicked over 100,000 people off of qualifying food stamps, even though all the money comes from the federal government, didn't save them a penny. They ended our entire appropriation to legal aid uh, because they didn't want poor people to be able to assert the even modest rights uh, that they have. Uh, they've demeaned poor people by uh, making them take uh, drug tests uh, in order to get our extremely modest uh, uh, participation in welfare programs. And then when it was demonstrated that uh, these drug tests were costing a whole lot of money and not yielding any negative results, they kept them anyway because you could still depend on those drug tests to humiliate uh, poor people. So uh, that's what we've got. We have a legislature that's waging war against black people waging war against poor people, that has embarked upon remarkable abortion laws that we ought to talk about, that is internationally famous for its attempts to shame gay and uh, transgendered folks, uh, that has the, uh, the most potent record for interfering with independent judicial review that's been seen in any state in generations, and that has waged war against democracy, including I mean, you know of uh, political gerrymandering and uh, the voter IDs and the like, but we've also violated the most crucial rules of democracy. Uh, for example, the rule of democracy that if you lose an election, uh, you may contest it, you may uh, try to get a recount, but when it's over, you go home and you say, I'm going to get them next time. You don't, if you lose the election for the governor's house, you don't burn down the governor's mansion. In other words, they violated that when they, when the governor, when, well, when Greensboro and uh, Wake County didn't vote the way they wanted, they changed the structure of government. When Roy Cooper won the governor's office, they dramatically reduced the powers uh, of the governor. When Josh Stein was elected attorney general, they cut half of his budget. So rather than waiting, running, trying to get a better candidate uh, the next time, they managed to burn down the barn, um, uh, which is violates the most foundational rules of democracy. So what's at stake is our character, our commitment to American democratic decision-making, and our decency as a people. So if this were to play out, which we have no intention of letting it do, but let's say, 10 or 20 years down the line, this keeps going. What is it, what's their vision for how that looks and works? It's like, how does that even benefit them to keep? Well, I think it benefits them because if, if their vision works out, they're comfortable with a government only for white people. I know that, I know that sounds extreme. Uh, and I know you don't think that of a whole lot of people that you know who are Republicans and who are voting for these folks. But you gotta say this, they like this notion. They like having a white people's caucus, which constantly passes laws to make life difficult for black people. That's all we know. That's what they do. That's what they do time after time. So I think they're comfortable only with a government for white people because that's what they're used to. And I think their policy agenda, they, they're gonna, they will embark upon uh, right-wing social causes. I mean, abortion and uh, school prayer and uh, other matters. Uh, but their main goal, what they come back to time after time after time, 
is to serve the economic interests of the top 5%. That's who they're after. That's who they uh, declare fealty to. Uh, and, and it's kind of a problem for them domestically. That is, uh, what, do you, what do you do if in three consecutive sessions, like they've done, you go in and you say, okay, we're going to uh, cut taxes for rich people and raise taxes for low-income folks. And you do that in year one, you do it in year three, you do it in year five. What do you do in year seven? So what, what are you all going to do this year? Three years in a row, you have uh, uh, given big largesse to rich people and made life more difficult for people, poor people. What are you going to do next year? Well, to be candid, they say, well, we're going to do the same thing. Why? Because it's the only thing we know. It's the only thing we actually are committed to. So to be honest, Becca, I don't know how that works out over the course of 20 or 30 or 40 years. One of the things you have to do is create a, a cover for it. It doesn't work well in a democracy, democracy to say, to put on your bumper sticker, come vote Republican, we serve the top 2%. Um, that, that doesn't work well. So uh, we constantly have this uh, deception that, well, poor people are going to prosper the most if we give a whole lot of money to rich people. That's that we don't really want to give money to rich people, uh, but we've got to do it in order to help poor people out. Now that's been proven false generation after generation, but you got to say something. You got to have some argument to make and the argument can't just be, we stand lockstep in the arms of the wealthiest benefactors because that's who pays the fare for us. But that's what they'll continue to do. Uh, in terms of domestic policy, they exist only to serve the wealthy. Uh, now they have to sometimes help bring religious folks on board to, to uh, help carry that out. Uh, and then their political uh, philosophy seems to be exclusively everything you can do to hold on to white people's government for as long as possible. Well, so looking to the future now, what are the mechanics of getting out of this mess? Have enough things changed politically and the political circumstances? Has enough been altered so that we can work our way out of this? It's like well, some, it's important to say, particularly to a group like yours, that uh, some has been altered, been altered successfully. We are in better shape than we were, for example, three or four years ago. For one thing, because of hard work from folks like you guys, we have a, a good and decent governor. Uh, now, that doesn't solve everything, but here's one thing. I spend a lot of time in low-income communities in North Carolina. And one thing, immediately, that electing Roy Cooper changed is that it no longer meant to poor people in North Carolina that all three branches of our government have us in their sites. They're, they're going after us. At least one branch of government, and then, uh, uh, as you know, a second with the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, can be on the side of regular folk, including people who believe in the American promise, uh, who believe in notions like equal protection of the law. Secondly, you know, in this uh, last election, the Democrats won enough that uh, uh, there are no longer veto-proof majorities in uh, both houses. That is crucial. And of course, it's crucial for us to put pressure on our Democratic friends to hold tight, uh, even in the session that we're dealing with right now. But we're in sight of uh, winning one or both houses. Uh, when we do that, there will be some dramatic changes that I hope we can make right away. Uh, uh, it's one thing now to sort of stop the horrifying bleeding. We've stopped some of it. Some of the worst ventures can no longer be pulled off now because of the combination of the governor and more Democrats in the General Assembly. Uh, but we need to go back and remake the legislative record of the last decade. Uh, and we won't do that until we get majorities in both houses and a governor. 
And the first thing we have to do, this is crushing us. It's been crushing us for uh, nine years. It's uh, crushing us more today than it ever has. We need to expand Medicaid. And the notion that uh, we are going into this crisis having intentionally massively wounded our healthcare system uh, uh, by sending our tax dollars to other states so that we can claim that we're more conservative than Mississippi, or we hate Barack Obama more than any other state uh, does. Uh, and when it means that thousands of Tar Heels die as a result of that, uh, that is the, there are many transgressions which these folks have committed, but I don't think there are any that match that. The decision to refuse and to continue to refuse to expand Medicaid so that last year, 600,000 folks in North Carolina would have had health care coverage if we would have expanded Medicaid. Then you go into the year and now what, a uh, uh, half million, a million, a million and a half that lost their jobs. Uh, and so a huge, gigantic uh, percentage of them are losing their health care. So we have a crippled health care system. And these folks still won't do anything about it. We have the worst unemployment compensation program in the United States. Uh, I wrote something here a while back because I, I looked at some old legislative hearings, which they had bragged about the fact that we had the worst unemployment compensation program in America. They thought that was a tremendous accomplishment. I don't know if they're still bragging about it or not, but I tell you this, millions of North Carolinians are suffering every day as a result of it. Uh, you would think we would all be paying more attention to it so that these, po these folks would be thrown out mid-season. Mid but uh, uh, their record is an outrage of wounds to normal North Carolinians thinking that maybe they should be worried about the guillotine being brought back in style. Well, we're no. very civilized. Uh, we, we are, I tell you one thing, we're supposedly so civilized that uh, they, kept, they keep telling me I'm, I shouldn't mention uh, that there, it's an all-white caucus and that it has a racialized agenda uh, because it's, it's uncivil uh, to yeah. say that. Uh, not uncivil to do it, it's uncivil to say it. Uh, so uh, I'm not for the guillotine. I don't mean to suggest I'm for the guillotine, but I am for throwing these folks out, and there's not going to be anything that works until they're thrown out. And if we don't name what it is, it's a lot harder to fight it. That's right. That is right. There are a lot of great questions uh, in the chat. The patients and Bonnie have been uh, paying attention to all these questions and they are going to read some of them out to you and we'll get to as many as we can. We will not be able to get to all of them, but uh, we'll do our best. So yes. I'll do my best too. And I'll try to do shorter answers, no problem. Okay. Um, Marilyn wants to know how impactful the Leandro decision will be with regard to public education. The court's recent decision in January, will Republicans fight? The you know additional funding to for education and and might they use COVID nineteen as an excuse not or to justify not providing additional funding? Yes, yes, uh, and so uh, the Leandro line of decisions, including the new decision, is crucial and important, uh, and in some ways path breaking in American law. But uh, the judges won't be able to successfully force a recalcitrant legislature uh, to fund, particularly to fund education, which will go uh, to the benefit of low income folks. Uh, these, I have a chapter on uh, education and it won't surprise anybody here uh, to say their agenda is quite clear, which is in effect to destroy public education. It's to, uh, to, constantly uh, beleaguer public education, to cut budgets of public education, uh, to force them to uh, uh, undergo uh, uh, intervention and regulation, to give all kinds of accounting uh, processes and the like, to make it difficult to be a public school uh, teacher. 
and then to provide these pathways out of the traditional public system to gigantically expand the charter program to uh, gigantically and unaccountably expand the voucher program so that uh, the goal is to starve public schools and to give all the money you might want to private uh, religious schools and charter schools which are in some instances operating like private schools that's a bar that's a large goal at odds with public education that's what they mean to do so they're not going to be anxious to give money to traditional public schools let me mention one thing consistent with this about public education which i think is indicative a little bit of our challenge um, i spend i've spent a lot of the last 20 years in small communities, in uh, urban, uh, uh, low-income communities all across North Carolina. And I'm convinced of this, not, not everyone is, but I know, I believe, North Carolinians believe in public education. I think it's sort of in their soul. They think the state has been better than it was 40 years ago because of the influence of public education. And they're not to the person, but by and large committed to it, they would not like it if they knew that their legislators were waging war on public education. Uh, whenever these Republicans run for re-election, you know, they switch uh, their affiliations <laughs> and, uh, and they run all their commercials acting like they're supportive of public education and then they go right back into the halls of the legislature and try to destroy it. I think most people would disapprove of that. But one of the things you know from knocking on doors and from phone calls is that most people, they don't want to pay close attention to what's going on in politics. They got lives to lead, they got uh, kids to support, they got two jobs to work at, they got soccer games to go to, or at least they used to and the like. They don't pay attention to politics and they don't want to. They're sensible people who don't want to pay attention to politics. I've always thought this, if these people continue to wage war on public schools for 15 years, uh, it sort of goes unnoticed as it does in the uh, society at large, then in 15 years, regular North Carolinians are gonna look up and go, God damn, they've ruined the public schools. When did the public schools get ruined? I'm opposed to that. I want good public schools. I want my kids to go to good public schools. And then people like you guys will say, well, I told you that they're trying to ruin public schools and they've accomplished it. And then I think North Carolinians are gonna be annoyed and they're gonna be mad about it, but it's gonna to be too late because uh, you, know, you can take generations to try and build up these institutions and you can demolish them in a year or six months or 18 months. So I think that's kind of indicative of the challenge we face. These folks are embarked on crusades against widely shared values and institutions and commitments. Uh, and most folks aren't paying attention. But if they don't pay attention, they don't engage, they don't participate, then we're going to end up being the loser in dramatic ways that we won't be able to reverse. Um, these folks, they readily brag now. They, they go to their ALEC meetings and the like, and they brag. Uh, Ralph Hives uh, said to a national magazine last year, without doubt, we have the most right-wing government in the United States right now, North Carolina does. And he was, of course, bragging about it and saying how wonderful uh, that was. That's what they're after. Uh, and I don't think that's what most North Carolinians want. They didn't, uh, North Carolinians don't want to out Mississippi, Mississippi or out Alabama, Alabama, but that's what we're doing. That's where we're going unless we stop it. Is there a progressive coordinated blueprint, you know, that's the counter to ALEC? Uh, no, I mean, you know, there are nonprofits who do uh, great work. Uh, uh, some in D.C., some in Raleigh. Uh, there's nothing like ALEC, uh, in part because uh, 
you know, there's so much money if your goal is to serve the economic interest of wealthy people. If you, if you are, as a, let's say you're a politician, you're agnostic about what your agenda is. Uh, if you decide that, you know what I really think, is, if I was a politician, for example, here's what my agenda would be. I think the United States is crueler to the bottom third than any major advanced nation. So I would measure everything by its impact on the bottom third. I would say overtly, yeah. uh, whatever's good for those in the bottom third, I'm for. Whatever's bad for them, I'm against. Uh, now, that's sort of the opposite of government in North Carolina and uh, in the United States. If, if a political candidate adopted my theory, then something bad would happen to him. That is, it would become a whole lot harder to raise money because uh, you know, there are a lot of poor people's packs. Uh, if, on the other hand, you say, uh, my goal is to feather the nest of the very wealthiest among us, uh, and you're a modestly talented candidate, you can run for office, you can string two sentences together, something great is going to happen to you. There are going to be dollars pour from the sky uh, because it's simply a good investment. You know, if you're Bank of America, better to spend a few million here in the political process and get a few billion back, uh, which happens time after time after time after time. So uh, I think we don't have an Alec because uh, the money's uh, not there, but we have a lot of great folk. Uh, we have a lot of people who work very hard. There are a lot of committed folks like uh, you guys and we can outnumber them. And the good news is, if these people don't believe in the American dream, the American promise, the American way of government, most of us do. So, God, I'd hate to have to honestly cling to their agenda, wouldn't you? Uh, I thought about this some, the last chapter of my book is about lying, about dishonesty. Um, and the truth of it is, having to look through their record, a whole lot of things that they want to do are unconstitutional. Uh, that just turns to be what their agenda is. They really like violating people's constitutional rights. Well, if a big part of your agenda is unconstitutional, then you got to spend a lot of time saying, making up lies to justify what you're doing. Um, um, you, you know, you can't, it's, it's unconstitutional to pass a law saying, uh, we don't want women to be able to get an abortion, at least it is today. Uh, so you have to say, well, we're, this, we're going to close down these clinics, but it, it's not because uh, we're against abortion. It's because we're concerned about the health of women who uh, might be undertaking this. Uh, they can't say, we're try we passed this voter ID law and we framed the ID requirement in this distorted way because we don't want black people to be able to vote because they're not voting for us. You can't say that, so you got to lie. You got to say something else. You got to say, well, I'm interested in voter fraud. Uh, now, I admit we haven't ever been able to find a case looking through uh, 7 billion entries, but I'm really worried about it. I can't sleep at night because I'm, I'm fearful uh, that people are going to the ballot box. Um, uh, that happens consistently in our General Assembly. I, so it makes me wonder. What is it like to have to lie all the time about what your agenda is? What is I, don't, I don't think these people are liars like Donald Trump who just lies all day long whether he needs to or not just because he, he's just got the habit. So he just he gets up in the morning, he starts lying, he lies all day, he lies all night, wakes up again the next day and commences to lie. I'm not, I don't know that Phil Berger goes home and lies to his wife and his family. I'm not saying that, but you get used to dissembling constantly about what you're trying to do, that harms democracy. It harms the operation of the political process. And frankly, I don't know what it does to you. I don't know what it does to a candidate who has to go to work and lie all the time. Um, I don't think we're, we're, we're running out of time here, but a couple of people have asked the question, um, 
you know, the Republicans will often say that Democrats did the same thing when they were in power. Is there truth in that? There is some truth in it. Um, now, what you want to say is they did a very, very, Democrats did a very, very modest version of what now can be done with remarkable effectiveness. So, A, Democrats never did anything like what's been done in the last 15 years, in, in no small part because it couldn't be done. The difference in uh, uh, computer technology and the like is so uh, pronounced. But I say a second thing to them. Okay, look, I spent a lot of time as one. I've worked on electoral issues for uh, many decades. I've worked hard against abuses of gerrymandering when Democrats were in office and Republicans were in office. Uh, why should there, when you think about me, or uh, I try to tell people, what about all these people? North Carolina has one of the highest percentages of people who have come to the state in the last 20 years. Do they not deserve a democracy because of whatever may have happened 35 years ago? Uh, did we tell them when they came here, look, oh, beware, you have forfeited your right to a democracy by moving to North Carolina. I don't, I don't know anyone who's ever thought that. I don't believe that. So even if there were modest a decade ago, two decades ago, they don't justify this persistent, outrageous cheating in the electoral system. Okay. I, I think this might be the, the last question, but um, it sounds what, like it. <laughs> what gives you hope? Uh, here's what gives me hope. Uh, I think a lot of people work hard. I think a lot of people have come to understand how bleak things are in North Carolina and across the nation. Uh, I think broadly speaking, when people learn of the outrageous violation of our shared values, which has taken place, they tend to say, I'm not gonna put up with that. And then the, the equality lawyer in me hopes a little bit, and this is hard, that even things like this virus, which is so horrifying, uh, which uh, is engaging in causing such destruction, uh, but it helps to reveal. I get, uh, okay, I work on equality things, poverty things all the time, have for 30 years. Uh, so in the last few weeks, I'll turn on the television and somebody on MSNBC will come on there and they will say, my God, we have really disproportionate impact of this virus in our healthcare system against black people. This is outrageous. You know, I want to say, God damn it, where have you been the last 55 years uh, when, now that you've reached your uh, heightened level of outrage? But uh, it is true that this is revealing uh, disparities in American life, which are so undeserved, so at odds with any kind of system of equality um, uh, that hopefully Americans will respond to them powerfully as you would hope. I mean, I, I like some, I probably some of you, I, I've become this gigantic fan of nurses uh, uh, in the last, uh, whatever it is, four months. Uh, I follow this uh, group of nurses uh, over at UNC. I'm prejudiced for UNC, I admit, but they're, they call them the badass nurses uh, over there. Uh, these people have such great courage, selflessness, who commit their lives, endanger themselves out of love and generosity towards other people. Now, a society which thinks that these investment bankers are more worthy than those nurses has lost its way. It's lost its way in the most powerful sense. A society that thinks the likes of Donald Trump could uh, uh, 
you know, walk down the field uh, next to uh, one of those emergency room nurses in terms of worth as a human being is uh, badly distorted. And I'm hoping we'll learn that a little bit from this. Um, so uh, I, I tell my students, uh, I'm sort of, uh, they get tired of me saying that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's an optimistic statement by Dr. King. I am uh, immensely taken with uh, a wonderful woman uh, from generations ago named, named Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, Mrs. Hamer used to say, if I fall, I'm falling five feet, two inches forward for freedom and justice. Those are optimistic statements about uh, what our future holds. Uh, I can keep to those about, no, oh, three days a week, maybe. Uh, I can always keep a fourth one, which comes from Vaclav Havel, you know, the Czech playwright and then uh, political leader. Havel believed in hope, but he said hope is not a description of the world around us. It's not a prediction of the future. It's a predilection of the spirit. It's a, it's a decided choice to live in the belief that we can make a difference in the quality of our shared and sometimes threatened lives. It is the nobler, I think it this way, uh, it's the nobler of contested hypotheses. Havel's definition of hope I can always muster. So uh, I'm hopeful uh, and uh, also, I've had a lot of fun, fun, lucky things in my life. I used to know Molly Ivins pretty well, and I learned from her uh, that, you know, even if as progressives or social justice activists, we don't win all the time, it is sure fun to be in the fight. Uh, and it's a hell of a lot better way to live. I guess that's Havel's notion, too. So keep up your great work. Thanks for letting me come uh, spend a little uh, time with you and uh, keep knocking on those doors and uh, maybe we'll do something in November which will work to give us the kind of government we believe in. Professor Nickel, thank you so much for that. You are getting uh, many thanks in the chat right oh, now. Yes. Lots of thanks. And some people wishing that there were praise hands in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but lots and lots of thanks and bravos. So um, I'm just saying this on behalf of everybody. Thank you so much. And um, to everyone who's here with us, clearly you have a lot more that you want to talk about. And I hope that you will bring those questions with you on June 17 when we continue this conversation with Nancy McLean, McLean and we talk about her book, Democracy in Chains. This and is great. You know that. It should be great. She'll be great. And in the meantime, please do join us for a phone bank because that is how we work together to set things right. And as Carol put in the chat, here's to that spirit of hope. So thank you everybody and good night. We'll see you again soon. Thank you all. It's been great. And uh, thank you. I maybe appreciate you'll it. come back someday and talk to us again. I think we would uh, all love that. Yeah, me too. All right. Thanks much. Thanks, Susan. Thanks so much, Professor Nickel. Thank you. Bye-bye.